What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I'm joined today by Dan. The video. Dan the video. I, I was questioning my the word choice that I had used. Not your name. I, I, actually, that part I had nailed. But there's too many vowels. Everyone. Gets there's it a wrong. lot of vowels. Everyone, in here. everyone yeah. gets it wrong. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can already tell we're gonna have some fun. Audience, make sure you hit WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for all the things that we've got going on with this show, and Whistlekick.com for the things that we are doing to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world, like this show, like our events, like products, like Whistlekick Alliance for you school owners out there. Check it out. Let me know if you have questions, Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. But over to you. Hey, thanks for being here. Hey, no problem. I appreciate it. Nice, raw, rainy day. Oh, my God. This this yeah. is this is quintessential New England spring, isn't it? You... Well, it's the door opening of spring, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> You're not, not quite sure how to dress. It's cold. It's rainy. But, you know, it's not winter clothes. But it's definitely not spring clothes. Right, and... right, right, right. So, yeah. One of those days I just want to. It's one of those days that you can do on the fire. Podcast. Or podcast. Yeah, now, if we, we could podcast in front of the fire. Oh, there you go. If we, if we could have done that, that would yeah. be great. We, we are at Karate International in Exeter, New Hampshire. Shout out, thank you to them. There is no fireplace. We have the space heater in here, but that doesn't quite count. That's right. Not the same. Yeah. So we get warm in doses. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. We're here to talk about you and your journey, your time training, and, and all that good stuff. Okay, so uh, I, I guess I'll kick it off. Yeah, <laughs> kick no it off. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, I started martial arts in a different way than most people do. A lot of people um, are out looking for different schools or a different way of learning the martial arts. I happen to fall upon it only because I was the oldest of four brothers and I was the only one that had a license when mm -hmm. I was, you know, 16. And my mom would bring your brothers to karate, bring your brothers to karate. So I'd bring them to karate. Had Sometime, they already been doing karate? They they started. Okay. Well, Mr. Durkin opened up his school in '74, mm -hmm. and I, at that time I was bringing my brothers there uh, when he had first opened. And I had a couple other friends. You weren't training. Too. No, you I were just not, transporting. I was transporting okay. because they were too young, right. to have a license. Okay. So I would bring them there, and I, sometimes I'd sit there and watch the class. So sometimes I'd just take off for an hour and come mm -hmm. back and pick them up. And over time, I'd say I'd talk to Mr. Dirk, and he would never like, you know, hey, you want to start class? You know, he wouldn't, he, he wasn't selling me, yeah. you know, because he, he just by seeing it sells itself. Yeah. So by me being there, I said, hey, I can do this. Ooh. And I started in 76, and I've been doing it since. I've been doing it for 48 years now. So that's how I started martial arts. It wasn't something that I was actually out looking to do. Okay. It was that, something that I kind of, fell into to osmosis, I that, guess. That is a different you know, story. Here we are. I mean, we've we've done close to 500 of these interview episodes, right. and I don't think we've had this one before. Right. So, did, yeah. do, you, do you remember what you were thinking sitting on the sides that made you say, maybe I want to do this? Um, well, I think it was over time. I don't think it was like the first time I sat there. It was, you know, it was over a period of time, but I just happened, like I said, I had friends that did it too. Sure. And my brothers were doing it. Do you remember so what I'm your like, friends were saying about it? Oh, well, no, they love it. They always wanted, they wanted me to, to do it. But I just like, yeah, well, you know, my interest was in music at the time. I was okay. playing guitar and stuff like that. And I just wasn't wrapping my head around it. I was part of it in a sense, yeah. you know, not directly, but indirectly. But the whole thing is it's, it's something that kind of just it, some spot my interest. I don't, I don't know exactly what it was. But the next thing I know, I'm on the dojo floor, I'm working out, and then I, from there, I just, I got bit by the bug, and I love it. I love it since then. So that's kind of like how I got into it, um, and and I stuck with it, Yeah, which is amazing to me, you know what I mean? Because cool. sometimes, you know, committing to something for 48 years, that's a long time. It was a long time. I mean, I haven't even been married that long. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm more married to my karate than I am my wife, you know? Don't tell, her. Don't, yeah. tell her. Don't, don't tell her you said that. No, she, she knows she's, she's uh, one, of the, one of the list there. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's a type of thing where it, it it's hard to say what it was mm -hmm. specifically that said, okay, I'm going to do this. I, I think it was just being exposed to it. What, what did your parents think? This idea that you're, you're bringing your, your siblings and then all of a sudden now you're doing it too. Um, no, well, I mean, I don't think. 
they really had any input into it because I was kind of already, a, you know, a teenager. But and, were they excited? Cause, um, I don't you, think so. I mean, my dad wasn't around, but okay. um, my mom, my okay. mom was a single, single okay. mom. But um, yeah, I mean, she's pretty. Yeah, do you want to be a, whatever, whatever you love. Be happy. Do, do, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, uh, and I paid for it myself. You know, she didn't pay for it. Yeah. So I don't think she really, you know, she's, oh, that's great. You know, because most parents want their kids to do well yeah. or do things that will make them yeah. better, you know, but that's just basically how it played out. I mean, you got to remember now, we're talking 48 years ago. I don't remember a lot of stuff that happened back there, <laughs> sure. you know? So I'm just trying to kind of recall, but that's basically the gist of how I got started. Okay. It's just through osmosis and just being there. And, and and back then, there wasn't a lot of karate schools. Right. I mean, they, they were far and few between. And if there were some, some of them were really bad. Then you had some that were really good. Mm -hmm. So I just happened to fall upon this. I mean, it could have been any karate school. You know, because I think there might have been one other karate school in town at that time. And then, of course, you know, as the decades go, they, you know, they're like the McDonald's now. Right, you know right. what I mean? You can see them like it's yeah. probably uh, We're three, three or four in each town you know, these days, you know. So so it's, you know, that's how I got into the martial arts. And and I've stuck it out, which is which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm, it's definitely been my uh, my grounding in life mm. is, is doing the martial arts, you know, because as you go through life, stuff happens, sure. things, you know, aren't always great because in, you know, in life any, you got the peaks and valleys, you know. Any any points in time you're you're willing to, to talk about where that grounding was important for you? Um, well, I think when, once I got my black belt, that was a huge milestone back sure. then. That's, you know, that was a big thing. Um, how, how about stuff more personal outside of training? As you know, far as when, when people talk about, you know, this is grounding for me, it suggests that. Well, it's, yeah, it's I mean, you growing, deal up, with growing up in a, in a broken family, um, it was tough. Uh, I grew, born and grew up, grew up in, in Somerville. Mm -hmm. So I'm a city boy, mm -hmm. you know, by birth. But uh, and we did a lot of crazy stuff there. Coming to New Hampshire was a total culture shock for, for, for me yeah. and, and probably my brothers and stuff. And, um, you know. Just that mentality, you know, it just as you get in trouble and shit happens and uh, can you swear on this? This is yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, well, you can. It's a miles. Yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, things happen and it, it just it gives me something to come back to. You know, it's something that's internal and it's something that's that's personal to me. Yeah. And that's why I think that that's what grounds me. So whenever something happens, I always internally mm -hmm. go there and, and I and I come out of whatever negative thing that, that has happened to me in life. And, and I use that as a positive saying, you know, I need this to get me above and beyond it. Where a lot of other people would probably use other things like substances mm -hmm. and stuff like that to, to, to numb the pain, I guess. So for me, it was more of an internal thing and just trying to focus in inward and try to bring out the best of, of whatever it was, you know, that was happening to me at that time. So, you know, that's kind of like how I use the martial arts. And, it, and it's a great tool to have because I can be anywhere at any time and, and it's always with me. Mm. And that's the great thing about martial arts. I mean, you must see, see you know, the yeah. same, you must see, do the same thing, you know, where, where the sun's down, you're like, all right, okay. And you just kind of catch your breath. You just focus on what the solution is mm. instead of what the problem is. And that's what a lot of people do. So, I think if anything, it's actually made my mindset more in a positive than a negative, mm -hmm. you know, half full and half empty. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's kind of like how I personally um, um, use the martial arts in my everyday, opposed to, you know, being on the dojo floor. But, yeah. you know, because you use it more outside the dojo than you do in the dojo. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, like I said, the mindset, mm -hmm. you know, and how you approach things and how you approach people. Uh, or how you deal and solve problems. That's kind of like how I, you use that, that, um, that energy, the positive energy mm -hmm. to hopefully resolve any issues that you have. And as humans, you know, everyone has issues. Everyone mm -hmm. just has different flavors, different times in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's how we come over them. So that's kind of like how I use it mm -hmm. as far as, uh, you know, keeping myself sane and, and, and keeping everyone else safe. <laughs> The, the, kind of the way you're talking about your childhood, um, you know, connecting some dots here that, that may or may not actually connect, but 
the other half, you're talking about positivity there. Were, were you were you at all an angry kid? Actually, no. Okay. I was the type of kid that got bullied. Okay. I got bullied. I wasn't the bully. I the, way, the way you were talking about Somerville made, suggested maybe you you were. That was just no, you know, no, no. Really, I, I was never the bully. Um, but we just get you know just kind of do stupid stuff, you know. Kids yeah. do stupid stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, and then, of course, you know, you're hanging around with a bunch of other kids. And, you know, it's kind of not, I don't want to say gang, but it mentality, the gang mentality. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got the pair More people in a group, the kids. dumber that group is. I know, I'm telling you. That's why I'd rather <laughs> be by myself. By myself. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was kind of tough. Um, and, it, it, I mean, it makes, makes me who I am today. Mm. So... I mean, there wasn't anything specific, but like I said, I, I was the one that got bullied. I remember when I was in the sixth grade, uh, this one kid kept coming up to me, pushing me and bullying me, mm. and I would I would just cower away. I wouldn't do anything. Uh, and then one day, I just got sick of it, and he came up to me, and I'm like, oh, man, we got... So as he was coming at me, I grabbed him, threw him against the fence, and I started, you know, hitting on him because yeah. he was doing it to me all the time. And then ever since then, we became friends. And really? He was, he was my best friend for like the, the rest of the year. And then, wow. of course, then we went into junior high because junior high starts at uh, 7, 8, and 9th in Somerville. So this was in sixth grade, you know. Yeah. So it was just it was just something that just happened. But, mm. yeah, I don't typically have anger issues. Um, never had anger issues. If anything, I'm more of the fun guy. I, I kind of solve things through humor opposed yeah. to, to anger or being, you know, peed off at anybody. So... That's, which I'm surprised growing up in the city that it's, it wasn't like that. The, 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 when, when you, generally when someone uses the phrase broken home. Right. Right. That's one of the first places that I'm going to wonder is, right. you know, what, what's the, what's the emotional impact of that? And, and especially you're the oldest, right? right, right. So it tends to be aggressive or humor. Are you right. trying to control Right. Or are you trying to make everybody's life better? Right. right? It's one of those two. Right. So you got and I think work. I think it's more the latter. I yeah. try to tend them to uh, make them better opposed to worse or be the aggressor. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I being being the older brother, uh, I mean, probably when I was little with the siblings, I don't know. It's a little bit different. But I would kind of like be the boss of them. I'm like, like the, had the third parent, you know what I mean? Uh, and a lot of, sometimes I, you know, I beat them up for whatever reason. I mean, yeah. I don't remember anything specific, Siblings. but yeah, it's just, just I mean, it was four boys too. So yeah. of course, you know, you know, how old's the youngest? Uh, well, the, I have two, two of them have passed. Um, oh, and, but so my, my, um, I have a, br I had a brother when I was younger, that was a year younger than me that passed when he was 13. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I have another brother that's two years younger than me. He's still he's still alive. He's still with us here. He actually lives pretty close to him. Yeah. And then I have my the youngest brother. He was four years younger than me, and he had passed uh, probably about four years ago. Okay. So um, you know, um, so we, you know there was a four year difference between all that, of us. That's, you know what I mean. So that's tight uh, for four. But but as the, as they got older, they started getting smarter. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. There's three of us and only one of him. <laughs> and that's, so that's, when I start, that's when I start uh, giving them, uh, you know, bullying them or giving them a hard time. They're like, I know you sleep. What, what was it like training with them? <laughs> uh, training with my brothers? Yeah. Uh, well, Where actually, they stopped. Innocent? No. They stopped. Yeah. Well, it very, very, that was very short-lived because when I started, they started moving away and they stopped doing it. Oh, they'd come back here and there, but never like consistently, you know, to get. Was that coincidence about. or was it because I think it was just coincidence. Okay. Like, it was coincidence. Yeah. They just stopped doing it. Actually, like I said, I was, I was a musician. Yeah. Well, wanted to be a guitar player. And I actually gave my guitar to my brother mm -hmm. who was playing now. Actually, I'm going to help him tomorrow night. He's playing them down in um, Boston, oh, you know, cool. Middle East tomorrow night. Nice. So, but anyway, um, I had given him my guitar, and then he just took off with that. He's still doing that, and I took off with the karate, and I'm doing that. Switch. Yeah, it's basically we basically switched hobbies, and then That's we just you know, and the here on. decades later, still going. Yeah, Maybe yeah, rituals. yeah. Same with him. Yeah, so it's just uh, it's just amazing how your life changes and like mm -hmm. that. You know, where you're you're um, initially looking for one thing, and then you wind up somewhere totally different. Yeah, you know what I mean, and then you're pursuing that to life. So. You know, it's it's just crazy how life is, yeah. you know, and, you know, you know how it is. I do. Yeah. Anytime somebody tells me they've done something for 
a few years, let alone decades. It suggests to me that that pursuit, that whatever it was, ended up in a position of priority over a lot of other things, right? Life throws a lot of options at us. Right. You know, um, you've been around long enough. You've seen plenty of kids graduate high school. They go off to college and that's the end of their training. Right. Or maybe they, they, they're local for college. They come back when they can. They graduate. They take a job over there. That's the end of their training. Or maybe they get married or they have a child. Right. That's the end of their training. Right. There wasn't an end of your training. No. How were you able to continue to make martial arts a priority, despite all of the things that life threw at you that also, I'm sure, at least at various times, you know, you got, you got married, so, right. so at some point your, your wife yeah, entered my the wife, list. my wife, well, she'd sit there and watch classes, similar to what I did initially, where um, that was a running joke with her, too, because she, she's a yarn down in, in Oh, she trains? In this, well, she, she did. She okay. does it now. But uh, she would do the same thing where she would sit and watch me do it. And I remember somebody interviewed her. I think we did a women's self-defense um, uh, class for some local cable company. And uh, they asked us, so how long have you been to karate? She goes, well, I've been watching it for about uh, seven years. And then I started doing it. And you know what I mean? So so by watching it, she counted that as time served, <laughs> so to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's just funny that that's how it happened with me. Yeah. I was just sitting there watching it and, you know, say, hey, this is, I, I can do that. And that's how I got into it. So she did it only because she was married to me. You know what I mean? So, because she knew it was a part of my life. Right. So, she, you know, she wasn't, it's either, it's either karate or me. She didn't give me that ultimatum. So she's not. That's good. She might not have won she's that ultimatum. Huh? She might not have won that ultimatum. Oh, I probably, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I think, I don't think I would have given it up. I think I would have somehow talked her into uh, why I should keep it. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, other than that, she, you know, she, um, she, yeah, she's awesome. I mean, I mean, How old I, were you when you oh, met her? I met her when she it was eighty one, so at that time I Five was years? I was Five twenty because I started I started at Buzz's at, in seventy six and I was nineteen at the time, so if I met her in eighty one, so I was probably you know twenty four okay. twenty five years old was okay. when I met her. She was nineteen I think when I met her, okay. um, so she was just a teenager, uh, but we've been we dated for like eight years and then we got married. And, a couple of kids later. Yeah. Cool. Your kids train? Uh, my son's a Sandan. Okay. Yeah, she's trained under me. And my daughter does not train at all. Did she ever? No. Uh, but the thing is, is that it's a, that's a funny thing where me, my wife, and my son train yeah. martial arts. But out of the whole household, we're all afraid of her. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, she, what, she, what, what she lacks in technique, she makes up with attitude. You know what I mean? So, uh, but yeah, my daughter, she's, yeah, I mean, if she, if she was attacked, she would. She, I, I, I pity the person that attacked her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, I mean, she's not technically uh, capable of defending herself, but just through her attitude. She's spirited. That's right. That's right. In the martial arts, most of most of the training is spirit. Right. You know, the techniques, the smaller part of the, the big equation. So, but so that's that's how my wife and you know she's always supported me. Um, geez, I remember back. Um, Actually, when we went to Okinawa for a uh, winter camp, mm-hmm. and we fought in the uh, um, all Okinawa tournament. And she was in. Uh, we left on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, I think it was in '85 or '84, going into '85. And she was in Hawaii for two weeks. She came home for 12 hours, and then I'm on a plane Thanksgiving Day heading to Okinawa. Mm-hmm. And so I was I was there for a couple of weeks, and and Mr. Durkin was there. There was a whole bunch of us that went down there. Um, and I got to fight in the All Okinawa Tournament, which was great, you know. And that was some that was a big milestone for me, um, you know, fighting in that tournament. I, I would imagine in Okinawan tournament that is open to essentially all styles. The world, yeah. In the eighties, was right. probably a bit uh, rough and tumble. Show um, say? yeah, it was okay. I mean, it wasn't too bad. Um, I, I mean, there were some people that got hurt. Yeah. Uh, but back in the day, I don't know if you've probably done tournaments. Uh, we never had safety gear. I was just thinking that all, all we wore was, gear was out, but nobody was really all, wearing it. Then. All we wore was a knuckle pad. Yeah, you slide it. It's a wristband, and it all it does yep. is cover your knuckles, so that way they, you don't hurt anybody when you punch them. Feet gear, no, not heard of. 
you know, and I think they required a mouthpiece. That was the only yeah. other thing. But, um, yeah, it was a little bit tougher than the sport karate you see today. Um, so it, it was it was quite the experience, though. And then I did pretty well. I, I, I went third in my division, which was great. Great, because I was like the junior black belt. Had you been competing here before you went over there? Uh, I've done tournaments, yeah. yeah. But n not like that. Not like that. It's, it was just a little different, yeah. uh, just the whole organization. Because over there, um, you know, uh, they 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 um, sensationalize one event opposed to at a regular tournament, you got 10 rings going all at once. There, it's just one ring and everybody's watching it. So the so the, all the attention's on the actual competitors, you know, so one at a time. So it takes a long time. You actually had to qualify to even get into the tournament. What so was the qualification? It, the qualification like? was you you went to you went to matches. Oh, okay. And if you lost, you were out. So you had to win a couple of matches just to get into the tournament. So it's kind of like uh, NCAA. Um, yeah, probably something like that. Yeah, yeah, where it's you know it's a qualification. Yeah. You gotta you gotta meet some criteria before you can get into the main event. You know, so it was it was pretty cool, I, and it was a great experience for me. Um, I got to train at the at a Masters Dojo, Master Wages Dojo, and it was just it was just an unbelievable trip. Mm -hmm. I wish I wish I could do it again. We've been talking about it here and there. You have you haven't been back to Okinawa. I haven't since. been back to Okinawa since. Okay. But we've been talking about, yeah. like, hey, you know, we should make another trip. It's been a while. <laughs> it's a couple <laughs> of years. Know, yeah. Oh yeah, a couple of decades. <laughs> what are you talking about? But yeah, I mean, it was it was a great experience. Um, and it just that really that probably was solidified my longevity into the martial arts. Mm. I think you know what I mean. Where that kind of like, hey, you know, what was it about that 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 locked you in? Well, I think it was just just being around around the master that we've mm. always been talking about. I've never seen for years, and now we're training in his dojo and we're competing and we're going to visiting other masters like it's Shinjo's dojo. We trained there, um, and I remember one time uh, we were there. And um, he was kind of sizing up the, the fighters. So it was me and a couple of other my students, you know, fellow students that were there. And he'd have us fight his students and stuff. And we were like just cleaning the floor with them. All right. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was a cool trip mm -hmm. just by visiting the different dojos. And each dojo had its own like aura about it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, you know, the Mini's dojo is more about weapons and Shinjo's was more about fighting. And of course, Master, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Grandmaster um, um, Weiji is was more like kata and, you know, really focusing on the technique and everything. So each of them had a different flavor, which I benefit from. Yeah. We all did. And it was, it was a great time. It was a great it, time. Said, it, was, it was like 125 of us that went there. We had chatted a plane and yeah, it was pretty cool. That's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's something about that immersive environment. I think whether it's martial arts or anything else, being right. able to focus on, maybe it's not one thing, maybe it's not you're just doing forms or you're just fighting, but you're focused on this thing that you are so passionate about and you don't have a lot of other things, right? I, I think um, if you've not had the experience yourself, you've had plenty of people that have told you, you know, they went on vacation somewhere Right. And that's the best place in the world. Well, yeah, because you've left all the things that you don't like about your life at home. Right. Right. And so you got right. to do that with martial arts and, and your relationship to martial arts gets right. even better as a result of that. Yeah. And of course, you know, I mean, Mr. Durkin, I mean, you've, you've interviewed him before. He's I great. mean, how can you not love the guy? He's you know, what I mean? you can't, you know, it's like you meet him, you talk to him. It's like, all right. You know, so he, he's a he's a great mentor, a uh, great leader. And he's a person that a lot of people look out to. And that definitely has a lot to do with why I probably suck it up, mm. you know, because it's that personal relationship between student and teacher. Even though he's got 100 students, he still has that personal relationship with each one of those people, yeah. opposed to, you know, okay, comes in the class, teaches and leaves, and you don't even really get to interact with them. And I think that interaction makes a huge difference in why people stay at certain schools mm. or stay with a certain person over those over the years. So I think that has, you know, that I think has contributes a lot to sure. why a student would stay at a, at a school. You know, I mean, you probably see students leave and come and go to schools yeah. all the time. Yeah. Why? Because they just haven't connected with their sensei or the person that's. How, how do you prioritize that connection? What what actions do you take in your time on the mats or on the floor? Um, as far as what now? To to make sure those relationships are created and nurtured. Well, you know, I, I think I think any dojo, uh, 
if it's if it's run properly, is a place that you go and it's a positive atmosphere. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, you can you can leave the all the negativity behind you when you step into the dojo, and it's not only the the relationship you have with your sensei, it's also the uh, relationships you have with your fellow students too. You build that 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 friendship, and over time, you know, it could expand outside the dojo. Yeah. And sometimes it's just relative in the dojo, but at least everybody comes to a common place where they know that they're going to be um, uh, propped up, or mm-hmm. or it's a positive experience. Every class, sure, you know sure. what I mean. So I mean, there are some classes, you know, you get some guy that's visiting, and he's just being a total whatever, you yeah. know. Um, but a lot of times they get pretty humbled quickly. <laughs> You know what I mean? Well, you know, you step in someone else's domain, you know, you better be respectful. You can't be, you know, going off on, on students or anything because they're going to just give it right back. When in Rome. And, but that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've seen some examples of people forgetting that they were elsewhere and trying to do it the way that they did it at their school. And it right. Doesn't... Yeah, yeah, it doesn't fly. So doesn't the thing work. is you need to adapt to whatever environment you're in. And that's like, you know, like this podcast, me sitting here with you, I'm adapting to a conversation. I I haven't met you ever. That's right. Until now, but we're sitting here having a conversation like we've known each other. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the only thing that we have in common is the martial arts. So that definitely is the the base, you know, common denominator, which is good. But at the same time, I'm I'm comfortable sitting here with you. And it's not not a, uh, um, a struggle of, you know, who's the better martial artist. Who cares? It doesn't matter. The thing is, is that we're, you know, we're, we're decent human beings and we're talking about something that helped us both, but at the same time can help other people. And that's why you do the broadcast is so you can get it out there. So these people can, you know, say, hey, you know, this martial art might have some, you know, validity to it. Let's, you know, let's check into it. Let's go see what the school is like down, yeah. down the street. You know, and that's kind of like how it all starts. I mean, it's just, you know, it's word, word of mouth. Mm-hmm. That's how martial arts really works. If you can advertise all you want, but usually a lot of people know somebody that's doing it. And that's how they do it. Why? Because they may like that person. They're like, you know what? I want to try that because I think I, I, I can benefit from it. And, you know, and that's it's just it's a big snowball. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the, the best advertising absolutely does facilitate word of mouth. Right. And, and the best programs in martial arts schools that bring people in are those that, honestly, they are they're kind of they're kind of subtle. Right. You know, it's right. not, not that there's anything wrong with referral programs and things like that. But the, the thing I tell, you know, I, I work with a number of schools. When was the last time you told your students, I would really appreciate it if you told your friends about what we do. Right. And when they do, make sure you look them in the eye and say thank you or send them a card. Right. 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 It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be financial. It can just be. Yeah, appreciation. Very subtle, yeah. Yeah, like you said, just the subtle appreciation is is really all you need, you know. Uh, so yeah. So I mean that's that's kinda like how I look at how people get into doing the martial arts is is through somebody they know. And you know, and that's just the nature of, of the business, I guess, so to say. You know? Yeah. Because I, I believe me, I've spent tons of uh, money advertising and stuff like that. And sometimes it, it, there's some rewards, but sometimes it's not at all. And I'm like, oh, man, I just wasted all that money. It, for can, be, it, yeah. can, it can be tough. And, and like I said, word of mouth, family members, and that's how a lot of family members get going into mm-hmm. it. One person starts it, everyone's watching it. Like I look back to osmosis. It's always, it's, it's like I said, that's basically yeah. the bottom line of, of how people start is either through somebody they know or somebody that, that's part of their family that's doing it and that's how they got into it. Yeah. And it, we see it all the time. There's a, there's a gravity, right? right. And, and, and for most schools, if they reach a certain critical mass relative to the population around, right. people can't get away from the conversations about martial arts, right? right? They're, they're, they're at a barbecue and there happen to be two people that train and they're talking about training and now they're hearing training and they're talking about these positive things and they go away thinking about maybe I should do it. Maybe yeah. I should do it. And, and maybe, maybe then they see the ad yeah. and that triggers them, right? Like it's a very complicated way that gets right. people into training. But you, you mentioned spending money. You, you, I think you said your son trains under you. You have a school? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I teach, I have I have a group. That okay, I you have a group. I don't have a commercial school. Sure. Uh, I rent the senior center a couple of days okay. a week, and then I teach that's, to me that's still a school. Oh yeah, you, well, you, yeah. It's I not know, a dedicated. It's not, I don't space. advertise. It's it's basically it's private lessons. Okay. Well, maybe semi-private. 
because I, I have a handful of students, guys have been with me forever. Yeah. Um, I, um, I did have a commercial school for 10 years um, and did that. And then, then we started having kids. So we were kind of like, ah. So know, it was a conscious choice. We, to step yeah, it so was, that, we were at a crossroad. We just needed to figure out what to do. So we tried to do the best of both worlds. Well, sure. That's when my wife kind of stopped doing it. Okay. So and, it wasn't your full time job? You were doing something yeah, else? At one time it was. It was. Well, for yeah, for a bunch of years, but I'm, I'm, I'm in IT too. Okay. So, and I had a business doing IT as well. A lot of us in IT. So, a yeah. lot of IT in the martial arts, a lot of music. In music, martial arts. Right. And I'm, I got both. I got yeah, music and, and uh, IT. I, I, and um, um, so we, we, we just kind of, and my lease is up, you know, because you usually do a five-year lease when you do a commercial rental. Um, <clears throat> and so we just decided that, you know what, let me go do it part-time. Mm -hmm. We take care of the kids. Love, you know what I mean? So that's how it still worked out. So I never stopped teaching. Mm -hmm. I just changed what where I taught and how much I taught. So that's kind of like how, how it all kind of transpired into what it is today. So, yeah, I, like I said, I've never, never stopped teaching. Um, like, and I rent a, rent a small space and, you know, it keeps me going, keeps me fresh. And I still get on the Mr. Durkins every week. So, you know, still there training. And, um, yeah, it's good, you know. So it's, when did you start teaching? How, how, uh, well, I started teaching, I started teaching at Mr. Durkins, uh, mm -hmm. probably, Probably right, probably right after I got back from Okinawa, around that time, you know, mid mid eighties, mid to late late eighties, um, and that's when I started teaching. And then I opened up a school in ninety, um, and did that for ten years. And then I then I went part time since then. So um, was teaching something that you had thought about before it happened? No, no, it all it all came from starting karate as mm -hmm. a white belt with Mr. Durkin. You know, and then over time, it's just like, you know, I can do this. Mm. You know, I can talk to people. I can teach them what, I, what I've been taught. You know, that's kind of like how I got into it. It wasn't something like that I wanted to do when I started or even before that. Uh, you know, like I want to become a teacher, but I'm not sure what kind of teacher I want. Do I want to do you know, kindergarten? Do I want to do high school? Do I want to do martial arts? Do I, you know, driver's ed, doesn't matter. I mean, I could, I could have taught anything. And that's something that I wasn't wanted to do. I didn't want to teach. Really? I mean, but it was, I wasn't against it. Yeah. It's just not like, just, something it I never thought of. Sure. Yeah. Until I started doing it. And I was like, yeah, I, know, I could do this. You know, Did you enjoy time. it right away? Oh, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I, I was teaching one of the classes at Mrs. Durkin's. You know? And actually, there's a couple of white belts that started there with Mrs. Durkin. Had gone and opened up their own schools at one time. So it was pretty cool just to kind of see them, you know, mm. like, you know, this, this one of the guys um, had a school, for, uh, I think it was Bella Ricca, for a bunch of years and became a, a real renowned martial artist. He moved to Japan and mm. was teaching there, too. And, um, you know, just seeing him from a white belt coming to where he is evolved to. It was kind of like it kind of felt like you know like you know you know I taught him you know when he was a white belt. <laughs> so it was it's just a it's a good feeling when you see somebody like that prosper and and become uh, very good at what they do, and you had a part of that, which is it's a great feeling. Yeah, it's a great feeling, you know. So you know, in life we got to take our happiness in small doses. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ooh. Yeah, and because you know there's a lot of crap that gets thrown out at you. So you just got to just kind of hopefully uh, repel it. Life's really good at throwing kicks. Oh, yeah, definitely. Whether you're standing or you're laying down, is, oh, yeah. life's pretty good at those kicks. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned IT. I also spent about 20 years in IT. I'm, I'm curious what what is your IT background? Background career? What is, what does that uh, yeah, like? well, back, way back in the back in the day, uh, actually before I even started karate, I was working for digital corporation i started there and uh you know it's just doing assembly stuff and of course it kind of spawned off of there and that was right around the time when like in the early 80s when personal computers started mm -hmm. to come of light but it was they were way too expensive you know two three grand just for a personal computer um you know if you spend three grand now i mean but in three know, grand then it's like 10 grand now oh yeah definitely Definitely. So that's how I got started. And then I kind of just uh, stuck with it. And I had, I, like I said, I had my own business doing IT repair okay. and a couple of clients and stuff. And then that, that's, that money got me going into the, open up my own school. So you were on the hardware side. That's yes. Kind of on the hardware side. So now, um, uh, I've been working for a defense contractor for about 25 years now, and I'm still doing IT and I do, I do, you know, hardware and software. 
Okay. So, you know, it, it's, it's a good job. It's a, it's a nice contrast, you know, between martial arts and the IT. Um, so, you know, it, but it, the thing is, is I can do the martial arts anyway. That's the great thing about it. Right. The, the reason I asked is, is I think, because we, we kept running into these guests that do IT, do IT, do IT. And, and we continue to have a lot of them. I think it's a mindset thing. I think it's m most, at least my enjoyment of being in IT was solving problems. Right. And I see at least the, whether I'm talking about teaching or really self-defense, it's problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good analogy because yeah, I mean, that's what we do. People call us, say, Hey, I have this problem. Okay. Let me help you solve it. And by being a martial artist, you're almost a therapist as well, too. Mm. So, you know, people come to you with their problems and they tell you their personal things. And what's your objective? Well, to hopefully guide them in the right direction or to give them the advice that they need. So, um, and hopefully the advice is, you know, transcends into something that's, <laughs> that's positive for them. You right, know? Right. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of like how probably why a lot of people are in IT and martial arts or whatnot uh, both together yeah. just for that, that process. They want to help people. They want to help them solve their problems. So, yeah, I, I mean, I get that. It's a, it's a good that feeling that you can help someone yeah. you know, yeah. advance yeah, exactly. whatever, whatever the situation is. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it, I haven't had any regrets whatsoever when, when it comes to martial arts. But you, you mentioned that your school now and its, its current incarnation is, you described it as semi-private. What, what do you mean by that? What well, that yeah, like? I just, I don't have a ton of students. Okay. So I just have a small group of guys. Um, basically, we're all black belts, so it's more of a black belt class. So we get to really work on some cool stuff. So you go yeah. deep. Because mm. I... Um, um, of course, I got the core of the Weiji, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I train. I told you I trained with Matt Brown mm -hmm. doing the Ruku Kempo with the pressure points and stuff. So, what was good about that was that no matter what style you take, you can incorporate that. Yeah. And that was one of the things that drove me to Matt. And it was something that I was kind of thinking of, and I always know that it was there, and I kind of researched it myself, but I wanted to get some formal training. And then when I met Matt, um, Matt Brown, that's when I really got into it. And I started, okay, let's, let's really. He makes it fun. Matt's been he on the show. I've had a he does. chance yeah, to work Matt, with him a little he's, bit. He's, he's, I love Matt. He's, he's like my best friend. <laughs> he's a good guy. <laughs> you know, but yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's a fantastic guy. And, um, and he teaches well, too. And mm -hmm. all the knowledge he has, if I only had a tenth of what he mm -hmm. knows, that a bit, uh, I, I'd, I'd be good. I'd be a good <laughs> at everything. You know what I mean? Just, I'm uh, just, you know, just in medical, yeah. you know, because he knows a lot. It's not sure. so much the hurting, but the healing part of it, which is part of the course. If you, if you know, if you're gonna learn how to hurt somebody, you gotta learn how to heal them. You gotta, you gotta understand both sides of that. that I think for a lot of us, that starts with, as we hurt ourselves. Right. How do I heal um, myself? Yeah. And then it becomes, hey, this helped me. Right. 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 So you know, that's that's one of the things that I actually incorporate into the training as well is the uh, the pressure points, and, and I actually teach them the the Ruko system too. Okay. My students, so yeah. they, they kind of get in the play. I told them, I said, you're majoring in Wei Chi, but you're minoring in Ruko Kempo. Mm. <laughs> so it's kind of like a double degree. So that's kind of like our approach it to the guys. And Matt and I are now we're talking about getting the curriculum where we can get these guys promoted nice. in, in his system. So, nice. that's awesome. yeah. yeah. Awesome. What keeps you fired up? Um, and, and before you answer, you're clearly fired up still. You mean as far as my About training, lots? yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of it has to do with just trying to preserve the longevity, you know, mm -hmm. of life. Um, that's, you know, that's another good thing about martial arts is that um, it gets you in that mindset to work out. Now, it can spill off, off the dojo where, you know, you can do uh, cross training. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be walking, biking, running, weightlifting. It doesn't matter what it is. I think they kind of go hand in hand, anything physical like that, that kind of keeps me motivated, keeps my energy going um, because I don't, I don't drink caffeine. Um, so I don't use stimulants to, to, to get me going. I just use what was given to me, you know, and I get up in the morning, like, um, like in the morning, especially when I'm at work, I, I do what's called a Tibetan rights. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that. No. It's they're, 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 they're kind of like yoga poses. Okay. It's what the Tibetan monks do every morning to, to get them, get their body just flowing with energy. Okay. So I try to do that at least four or five times a week. Oh. Uh, the weekends usually I'll just back off and, you know, kind of those are my days of rest. Mm. Well, 
other than the Saturday class at Buzz. <laughs> so after after Saturday afternoon and until Monday, those are my days. That's your weekend. Yeah, that's that's my recover day. <laughs> Again, you know, I'm 67, so it's you know I gotta you know I gotta pace myself these days. I can't go but too. <laughs> I was having a conversation with somebody last night. You know, I'm 44. Yeah. But how many people my age? I'm looking around and I'm going, really? And I was talking with somebody last night who's in his 50s, and he was talking about going to the, the first high school reunion he'd been to was just a year or two ago. And people he graduated with in walkers, yeah. you know, in more more than one. Oh yeah. If you're 67, you don't have to be terribly observant to notice that a lot of 67 year olds not only aren't as active as you are, but they're barely moving. Yes. Well, that's because they haven't been moving. Right. So when you don't move, you move less over the, over the, over the years. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you have to move, even if it's just getting up and going for a walk. And even if you're walking around your driveway, it doesn't matter. You need to get up. You can't just sit there because, because I've been talking about this about retiring from mm. from my job and stuff like that. And they're like, "Oh yeah, don't retire." You know, most statistics you say that you're it? gonna die. You're gonna die within the first five years after retiring and all that stuff. And the reason why is because what happens is when someone retires, they don't do anything. They lose purpose. Yes, they just sit there and they just become. They just basically just melt into the chair and then out of life. You know, so it's a type of thing where you've got to have something to do or to keep you occupied even after the retirement. Because right now we have purpose by working, you know, somebody pays us to come in to, to, you know, problem solve and, and and you're moving, you know, so uh, most jobs, I mean, my, I do have a desk job, but I do move. So like, um, uh, a lot of times, like when when I'm at work, I'll, I'll go for 10 minutes, I'll go off the gym and, and just do something. You know what I mean? Uh, lunchtime, I'll go off a walk. I do the, the yoga, mm-hmm. the Tibetan stuff in the morning. So I, I'm, I'm constantly doing something. So a lot of the guys, you know, they'll. I know a couple of a couple of my coworkers. They'll go and have a smoke every ten, every you know, ten minutes every hour. Well, I go to the gym for ten minutes every hour instead of having that smoke. You know what I mean? So that's kind of like how I keep my going, myself going. I try to break it down into more manageable mm. workouts. So instead of doing a long workout, I just do micro workouts. It's just as efficient. Because it's as easy effective. as life. It's easy enough for life to steal that you know enough of that whole workout that you're not going to do it. Right. And that's why people you know they leave it for the end of the right. day. It never gets done. But I'm a, I'm a firm believer. You know, a couple minutes, a couple times a day right. that accumulates. Oh yeah, it does. So I mean, if you're doing micro workouts for five ten minutes a day, like say maybe five six times, that's a lot of activity. That's that's not counting the activity that you would normally do. That's just the activity that you've chosen to to stop doing what you're doing and go do it. And then you know, and so to me that makes a huge difference on our longevity. It does. Where we don't want to be those guys in the walker or with the crane, uh, you know, the cane. cane. <laughs> crane, yeah. Well, we might I, I wouldn't mind being in a crane. I, mean, yeah. well, I, I don't want to be on the receiving end, but I'll you know I'll, I'll get in the cab and. Yeah. So I mean, that's to me that's just essential. Life one on one. So mean, you've got to move. So if you did retire from your day job, yeah. what would you fill that time with? Um, I think. Well, that, that's that's the question. I mean, I'm very marketable as far as what I can do, but um, I had briefly joking talked to some people and maybe be helping them in in their school. You know what I mean? Maybe join uh, some school and uh, help them. You know, teaching I mean, martial arts yeah so you you feel that yeah you I'd probably do something like that i don't know part it's part time yeah I mean, i'm gonna do it full time you know mm-hmm. the whole purpose of me retiring is not to work full time you know so but yeah i mean i would i could see myself doing more of that maybe some more seminars and maybe traveling with matt more and doing helping him with his stuff you know so that's i think that's what i would do i mean believe me i i don't i don't have a lack of things to do plus i have a, own a home so I, there's a lot of crap yes. that i've been wanting to get to that I can start working I, on. I once heard somebody say a New England home is never finished. It never is. And and I, by the time this comes out, it'll probably have happened. I've sold my home. Just recent? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's under contract right now. Should be, should be done right about the time this comes out. So in the 12 years I owned a home, it wasn't done. No. There's always more projects than I ever had oh, yeah. time, enough time and money to address. Oh, yeah. There's always something. I have some breaking. I mean, my house, I built it like 26, 27 years ago. So, you know, 
I'm looking at the roof. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't look too, you know. Original, original <laughs> roof? Yeah, the original roof. Yeah, this is good. Well, I got an architect shingle, so that helps. Okay. It gives you a little bit more longevity. Yeah. But still, eventually everything's going to wear down. doesn't matter. Nothing's what permanent. Are. That's right. And especially even us. We're not even permanent. Even us in the eat. And, and, and let's go here now. Let's, let's talk about that permanence of, of skill. You're cross training, you're doing a variety of. Uh, this camera's been a little. M most people listen rather than watch, but the camera's been a little uncooperative. Right, I just noticed it. I appreciate right. that. Here, let's <laughs> let's do that. Let's see what happens here. I, I tend to move around and I think it has a hard time focusing. But, oh, right. So I know, we're both over there. We're, yeah, <laughs> gesticulating wildly. It'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I find fascinating about martial arts training is that the longer we're doing it, the more we get exposed to, the more we realize we'll never be able to become expert level at all of it at the same time. Right. That maybe, okay, so I'm going to really focus on my forms now. I'm going to have to let some other things b fall back a little bit. And you're, you're adding other curriculum into this. How do you balance everything that you have in your repertoire right. with what gets the attention well I, I think a lot of it it doesn't matter what you do um, for a style or in, in any other type of martial arts um, it's it's an ongoing thing mm -hmm. it, it is you you can never perfect it mm -hmm. you're always trying to do better um, if you if you resign to that then you will succeed because a lot of people if they said okay I know it I'm perfect at it and what happens? They stop doing it. Right. So the thing is, is that right? It starts going down. So, so the thing is, is that you you can't you can't settle uh, of, of your own training. Mm -hmm. There's always something to do, and that's why you have a sensei because your sensei will always find some flaws in you. You know, something that you've done perfectly for years, all of a sudden is not done properly now. It's like, okay, why? Well, maybe because, like you said, your focus is somewhere else, and you're doing something else, and then this here kind of gets pushed off to the side. Or maybe and even the grades. Damn. And then you they get better at understanding what it could be, and they're pa right. passing that expectation down to you. Right. So, so it's a type of thing that you just got to kind of uh, constantly think. Mm. Uh, you know, I can I can never be perfect at this. I always something that I need to work on, and that's what kind of keeps you humble. Mm. You know, because it's a tough guy that thinks he knows it all is the one that probably gets hurt. And I've, I've also um, I've also talked to martial artists that um, you know. Oh, you do martial arts? Yeah. It says, oh, I, I got a black belt and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, really? Where do you train? Oh, I haven't done it in 20 years. Okay. So how polished is that person to defend themselves? Yeah, they may know how to throw a punch. They might not do a block, but how they practiced at it. Yeah. So if anything, by doing it and keeping yourself on a regular regimented schedule, you're keeping yourself refined. And that refinement is going to bring you to a plateau over your lifelong training. And that's kind of like how you have to approach it. You can't approach it to like a college degree. All right, mm -hmm. I got my degree, I'm done. You can't do it that way. You know, even though you got your black belt, I'm done. No, you can't. You got to keep going. I mean, you really don't start to learn until you're a black belt. You really got a nice, somewhat, you know, basic foundation to work with now. You know? But how, how many schools present a different expectation early on and they see those students they earn their black belt and they quit because we message to them from early days right you got to get your black belt it's not right. you got to do this forever right which is really that's what you're talking about i, I believe right. the same thing this is a thing that will continue to pay more dividends in your life than just about anything else and i would say anything else over the entirety Right. You know, if you, if you break your leg right. and you want to rehab that leg, that's going to pay more dividends than ignoring it and going to class. Right. But your leg isn't going to be broken indefinitely. Right. Your life is always ahead of you and martial arts will always give you tools to better that time right. you have left. Right. Exactly. And, and to keep it, keep it moving, keep it greased so that way there it works for you. Because right. if you hurt your leg and you don't move for years, what happens to your leg? You do yeah, great. Do now, yeah. you gotta, now you're on a cane. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's one of the things that we're trying to stay away from. That's right. You know? So, yeah. So I, I think I think, I think, think the bottom line is you can just never settle. Mm -hmm. You know, always think that there's always something that, that you need to work on. You know, that's our and, slogan? Never settle? Never settle? Yeah. Yeah. For your dojo? 
for for whistle kick. Oh, really? It's not on this hat. On some of the hats, it says "Never settle" on the back. Yeah, I mean that's basically that's the key. Yeah. If you if you don't settle, there's always there's always something to do, you know. And 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 getting back to you know, you said incorporating the uh, the pressure points and stuff like that. I, I did it as an added value to what I already do. So it wasn't anything new mm-hmm. that I was teaching my students. Uh, I'm just kind of guiding them why we do it this way. You know, when you do a strike, you know, we're striking certain points of the body. You know, and it was designed that way because you're trying to get the optimal effect out of the one movement opposed to hopefully something hits. You know what I mean? So that's why you want to try to be as as efficient as possible with your technique. And the only way to do that is you got to keep doing it. You got to keep refining your own your own training, and at the same time, as a as a sensei or a teacher, you got to help your students do the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so I never put myself above the students. I always put myself with the students, because that way, there I'm a student first before I'm a teacher. Yeah. I I have to keep training. If I don't, then how am I supposed to grow and build and pass that on to my students? So. Yeah. I, I, there are a lot of instructors out there, and I've, I've talked to them. They've been on the show. Their only consideration, really, of of rank, is right. so they can continue to bring up their students. I think there's really there's really something beautiful and elegant about this this structure that we generally have, and it's why I like the term sensei and, and right. the definition that I understand. One who came before, right? Exactly. You know, we often simplify it to teacher, right? But I, I like the other definition better because, and I, and I tell my students, I'm in front of the room not because I'm perfect, but because I know stuff that you don't and you want to learn it. Right. Doesn't mean I know it perfectly. It doesn't mean right. I'm not. That it doesn't mean I'm done learning. Right. I learn just as much, if not more, teaching them. Teach exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love teaching for that. Reason. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's great. I mean, like uh, like on Saturdays, uh, Mr. Durkin will turn to the seniors and say. Uh, you know, you, you want you want to do something with the class, you know, like five minutes or whatever. Yeah. And um, and I always pull something out of the class. Yeah. I don't like come prepared with something. I just kind of go through the class and I see what they're doing, and then I just take something from that. And I'll either expand on that or I'll um, tailor it around yeah. that theme. You know, so that's kind of like how I teach. Um, <clears throat> and white belt can do something, and I'll, and all of a sudden it'll hit me. I'm like, oh my god, you just taught me something. Right. And I'll and I'll give them the kudos too. I'm like, you know what? That's a that was a great analogy or a great explanation or a great move. That you know what? I can move use this and over here on this other thing that I'm. They're doing. not entrenched with what we've taught them. Eventually, they're going to move like us. But right. yeah, watching those early day white belts and because they're going to teach you a lot about what you thought you knew. Right. They're going to teach you how things can be done incorrectly that you right. never imagined. Right. Make sure that you actually know what you're teaching because. Right. How many people get in front of some new white belts and think they know how to teach it? Well, then... I tell you, man, I, I, people would rather die than get in front of a <laughs> group of people and speak. Right. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, you know, I, I think it. I think the martial arts itself will give you that confidence mm-hmm. to get up in front of the class and do that. Uh, a lot of times I would take the shyest kid and put him up on the front. All right, all right, do the uh, first couple of exercises yeah. and just have them count out out loud. And I tell you, that probably did them uh, more service than the actual karate itself is getting them up in front of somebody and just doing something to build that confidence because that's what one of the attributes of martial arts is to build confidence yeah right yeah i mean that's one of the one of the traits so that's what you're trying to do for those students so um yeah and and it's just um it, it overall it's just overall i can't think of anything negative about martial arts that i can think of you know what i mean i do so he, here's here's a question Imagine an alternate universe where you didn't drive your siblings to karate class. You didn't get that FaceTime watching what it was. You never started training. Obviously, life would have been dramatically different. Yeah. But in what ways? What, what you know, some, some weird... Uh, um, some weird occurrence happens where I start interviewing non-martial artists. Right. And you end up in this chair next to me, and I'm asking you about your life. Right. What would you be telling me? Oh, Instead of know. talking about martial arts, you'd be Well, I would about probably it. be talking to you about something that I'm into, whatever mm-hmm. it may be. You know what I mean? Some other passion? Yeah. It could be, be, could be music. Okay. Um, uh, it could be IT. 
because I, I started IT before I started martial arts. Would you still be as this, I could. this active? I don't know. It's hard. That's hard to say. I, I can't. I can't say that I would or I wouldn't. I, maybe I would be doing something. I really can't say for sure because I only know what I know now. You know, this is the path that I went. So I, it's I, like, I, I can't really I give you a definite or even a speculate uh, another answer because it's this is all I know. So. Yeah, I, I'm, if my life was different, I don't know what I'd be doing. I would hope I would still be active in some form or another, whether it's just going to the gym or whatever, you know, running or biking or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. That's, that's a, it's a weird question to answer. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I don't think I can come up with an answer. I, I think because generally when I ask this question, I don't ask it often, but when I do, I usually gets a sort of answer like what you're giving it. And I think right. what is most valuable in that is it helps us see that martial arts has, has woven its way into who you are at such right. a fundamental level that you can't even conceptualize of what anything else. could be without right. it. Right. Right. And, and I, martial arts predates most of my memories. Right. For me. Yeah. So I, I can't, you can remember bits of at least of the time before you started training. I really can't. Well, so I get it. Yeah, yeah. I, started, I was really fortunate. I started training when I was four. It's been oh yeah my well, whole there, there life. Go. Yeah, there you go. And and I'm so thankful for that. You know, I one of my goals is that I live long enough. I can say I've trained for a hundred years. There you go. Well, yeah, you probably you probably get more hundred years than I would. <laughs> Because you you got fifty. The numbers, years are, ahead of numbers me. are a little bit in my favor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you still got a lot more life to live too. I do you know what I mean? I do. I I, I don't plan on stopping yeah. anything. Yeah, I mean, you we're still this we're still going at this. We're still going at everything. Right. If, if something's worth doing, it's worth continuing to do. Exactly. So that's that's why we keep going back because we find that it's positive for our lives, and 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 anybody that does train does that too. So even if they've stopped, they always wish they were back. Oh yeah, I'm and they still back. can, and so and they still can, and some do, but life gets in the way. They either like go off to college, or they get married, they have the kids, and we've done some of them. I get emails all the time from people that watching or listening to this show is their intermediate step between to get back into it. I want right. I, I want to get back, and I get back, and they they watch or listen. Right, they're in the audience. There are some of them out there right now right. that hopefully they hear your words and they say, you know what. Right. Do it. Okay. Right. I mean, that. yeah, that's all it is. I mean, like, in a sense, if somebody's watching this, they could be, it's like you said, some could spot them and like, you know what? I'm going to go back. Or I'm going to stop late. working out, no matter, even if it's not martial arts. Yeah. Yeah, this is, you know, I, I got to do something. The couch because, is not a good life plan. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's a death plan. <laughs> we don't want that. That's true. You know, I mean, because we only have one life to live. So we just, we got to do the best that we can and live as long as we can and live uh, in fulfillment of happiness and, and positivity as much as we can, because the, you know, the negativity is out there, man. I mean, as, as human, human nature, we always repel the negativity and by going into the dojo, it, at least I know it's a place where I don't expect that yeah. and I can get away from it all. Um, Cause I, we had this, um, just a little story, yeah. this kid that um, he was going through a divorce and, he was coming to the class and he was really just angry because he was going through it. But it was, it was coming out working with other students and the other students were kind of like, Oh, you know, in an unhealthy way. No, in a, in a negative way. Okay. You know what I mean? So, so, you know, he was going pretty hard with this other kid and the other kid, you know, you can keep up with them, you know, uh, as far as, you know, fighting and stuff like that. But, um, afterwards I pulled him aside and said, is everything okay? He's like, oh yeah. He said, yeah, I'm going through a divorce, blah, blah, blah. I says, dude, I says, I go, I, you know, I sympathize with you and anytime you want to talk about it, that's great, but you've got to leave it outside the dojo. You can't bring that anger or that, that's, you know, that, that, uh, that, that negativity into the, into the dojo because people are saying it and it's going to, and they're not going to want to work out with you anymore yeah. because you're just too, too intense for them. So you got to just kind of back up hurt. a little bit. So, but, but that's, that's a place where he actually, and he says, oh, thank you so much for telling mm -hmm. me that. Cause you know, where else is somebody going to tell him that, you know? So he, he came in trying mm -hmm. to take it out on someone else. 
I called him on it or at least brought it to his light. And now he's aware of it. And now hopefully he'll just keep it yeah. outside the dojo. You know what I mean? And then deal with it when he has time to deal with it, not in this environment that we've created safe, positive, friendly environment, yeah. which we call the dojo. <laughs> well said. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, how could they reach um, you? Well, they can get a hold of me at dandavideo at yahoo.com. Um, I also have a YouTube channel called Live Dandy. Okay. Um, they can they can get a hold of me that way. Um, but yeah, just then awesome. do Mr. Derek in school. You can get a hold of me. Okay. So I'm gonna close out and then I'm gonna throw okay. it back to you to to end so you can think about how you want to leave things. Hey, to the audience, thank you for being here. Remember whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for everything related to the show. Whistlekick.com for all the things related to all of the things, whether it's uh, our product lines, our events content we do a ton of different things if you haven't been to the website lately you're missing out because i'm updating things on there at least weekly so please check it out and thank you for all of your support especially all of you out there contributing to the patreon if you want extra behind the scenes bonus content all that good stuff sign up for the patreon you started two bucks a month two bucks a month two Ooh. bucks a month hey yeah if, if okay. the only way we tell people the only place people find out rather where the upcoming guests right are who they are is on patreon Oh, okay, cool. Right out anywhere else. So right. people who are throwing in their, their two bucks, and yeah, we've got higher tiers with more stuff, but uh, I just, I did, I think, three updates this week on Patreon. One of them was, here are all the upcoming episodes we have scheduled, including the four that we did today. Right, cool. All right. Whistle kick, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thanks for being here, Dan. Yeah. But what do you want to leave the audience with? Like, how do you want to close out for them? Well, I think, I, I think if you're in the martial arts, just kind of make sure that you 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 kind of just focus on being the student opposed mm -hmm. to being the teacher. Um, if you're a student, then that's that's great. But uh, sometimes some instructors don't or they forget how to be a student. If you just remember to be how to how to be a student, I think your your own training and your own uh, thirst for that knowledge will stay there because once you decide that you're it, you know everything then the well dries up and you got to keep that well, well plenished. You know what I mean? So you got to just, just keep going and just thinking, yeah, okay, I still need more to work on no matter how long I've been doing it. I mean, even Mr. Durkin still needs something to work on. doesn't There's matter who you are, work. you know what I mean? So it's a type of thing that it's just, it's an evolution that just keeps going and going and going. And then there's only one time to stop is when you're no longer with us. And that's basically what you want to be doing for the rest of your life is to be the student. And of course, once you become a student and you have enough knowledge, pass it on. And that's, a, that's another thing too, is pass on what you know, don't hold it for yourself because it's not going to do anything, anybody any good if you hold on to all that, that knowledge. So always pass it on. Okay. You always keep one thing under, under your reserve because you don't want to give them everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I think that would probably be the, um, the, um, the message to send, you know, to stay a student and never settle. And I like that. Whistle kick, never settle. Didn't tell him to say that. I I, he did. No, I <laughs> believe me. It's 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 a staple for every martial artist. Well, any okay. sane martial artist, I guess. <laughs> Good stuff. So, okay. all right, buddy. Appreciate your time. Yeah, man. thanks for having me.